The theme of our conference this year is Challenging Linearity. Welcome to this evening's keynote lecture by Professor Alf Nilsson. Uh, Professor Nilsson, we're going to start without your slides and hopefully have them catch up uh, once you've started speaking. Professor Alf Nilsson is the director of the Center for Asian Studies in Africa at the University of Pretoria, where he also works as a professor of sociology. His research focuses on the politics and political economy of development and democracy in the global south, with a specific focus on India and Asia. He has written extensively on the role of social movements in shaping development trajectories and state-society relations. His key books in this field are Dispossession and Resistance in India, The River and the Rage, and Adivasis and the State, Subalternity and Citizenship in India's Bheel Heartland. Professor Nilsson has also explored the relationship between Marxist theory and social movement research in great depth, evident in books such as Marxism and Social Movements and We Make Our Own History, Marxism and Social Movements in the Twilight of Neoliberalism. More recently, his work has come to focus on the rise of authoritarian populism in the global south and the relationship between the politics of authoritarian populism and the social crisis of neoliberalism. It is this work that he will draw upon in today's keynote lecture. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Nelson. Over to you. Thank you so much, Alia, and uh, thanks uh, to IBA for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor, it's a pleasure. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to be there in person, but I'll try and do um, uh, as good a job as possible uh, uh, remotely. So my lecture today is concerned with the way in which authoritarian populism has emerged as a political project and more specifically a hegemonic project uh, in uh, and across Asia, Latin America, and increasingly also, and I can testify to this, Africa. I'm speaking to you from Johannesburg today. Um, what I'm concerned with is the fact that uh, as of the early 2020s, uh, leaders such as Narendra Modi, Jair Bolsonaro, Rodrigo Duterte, Mahinda Rajapaksa and Tayyip Erdogan and the political projects that they represent, whether they are in government at a given point in time or not, um, have become a mainstay of political landscapes across the global south. Truly one of the morbid symptoms of our time, they represent an authoritarian populism that since, um, the, uh, that since the 2010s has become a major political force uh, in southern countries in our present troubled moment. At the core of southern authoritarian populism lies a political vocabulary uh, centered on an authentic people that must be defended both against corrupt elites and their ominous others uh, by coercive and often violent means. Crucially, uh, these political vocabularies have found resonance amongst the Bolton groups in the global south, and this has played an important role in propelling these leaders to power. Uh, obviously, in my context, South Africa, we can see this form of politics emerging on the margins of an eroding ANC hegemony. In short, authoritarian populism is a political force to be reckoned with in the global south. However, as the geographer Gillian Hart has uh, noted in a recent essay, Euro-America remains the focus of the vast bulk of writing on resurgent nationalisms, populist politics, and the rise of the right. Hart calls for a critical inquiry into far-right politics to adopt a global conjunctural frame and argues that in doing so, we need to consider countries in the global north and the global south as variously connected and yet historically specific nodes in globally interconnected historical geographies. Hart's intervention is, a de is indeed a timely one, given that the stakes of our particular conjunctural moment are so very high. 
And these notes then constitute my own cursory response to Card to Heart's call. Uh, they are a very tentative first cut at an analysis of the politics and political economy of authoritarian populism focused squarely on the global south. So my approach takes the form of an attempt at what Stuart Hall, the British cultural theorist, uh, called conjunctural analysis. That is a form of analytical intervention that's more concerned with understanding what he referred to as strategic shifts in the political and ideological conjuncture, rather than with uh, the level of pure theoretical analytic operation that much and too much, in my view, Marxist scholarship is concerned with. Hall's approach uh, draws from Gramsci, of course, whose work he found to be characterized by thinking large concepts in terms of their application to concrete and specific situations. The purpose of conjunctural analysis, in turn, was to produce what I tend to refer to as insurgent epistemic gain, that is, forms of knowledge that might enable effective oppositional and transformative collective action in moments when a number of contradictions at work in different key practices and sites come together in the same moment and political space. These notes are to be regarded as precisely this, a conjunctural analysis of reactionary right-wing politics in the global south in the current moments, aimed at understanding what it is that enables such political projects to flourish and thrive, and also at understanding just what work it is that authoritarian populism does for governing elites and dominant social groups in southern countries. I hope that by clarifying our understanding of the nature and workings of Southern authoritarian populism, we might also be better able to think more clearly about what kind of uh, oppositional uh, collective action uh, might uh, be necessary uh, in order to effectively disrupt and challenge such reactionary political projects. In carrying out uh, this conjunctural analysis, I draw on two concepts. Firstly, Hall's notion of authoritarian populism, and secondly, Gramsci's notion of an interregnum. And I'm going to briefly uh, unpack these concepts and then move on to put them to work uh, in the kind of conjunctural analysis uh, that they were intended to facilitate. What we have to understand, Stuart Hall wrote uh, in his seminal uh, 1979 essay, The Great Moving Right Show, uh, is a move, sorry, is a move uh, towards authoritarian populism, an exceptional form of the capitalist state, which unlike classical fascism, has retained most, though not all, of the formal representative institutions in place, and which at the same time has been able to construct around itself an active popular consent. The reference point for Paul's concept was the hegemonic project of Britain's conservatives under the leadership of Margaret Thatcher, which had emerged in the concept of the breakdown of the post-war order, which gravitated around Keynesian accumulation strategies and the welfare state. Responding to this crisis, Thatcher's Conservative Party managed to win public consent for a hegemonic project that fused neoliberal accumulation strategies with an ideology that pitted an authentic and virtuous British people against their other. The other here was a composite entity made up of criminals, welfare scroungers, left-wing subversives, and migrants. And these others were to be curbed and controlled by using the coercive power of the state. In these notes, I conceive of authoritarian populism, or more precisely what I refer to as southern authoritarian populism, as a hegemonic project that aims to shore up consent for neoliberal orders that, for most, if not all, intents and purposes are dead, but we still stubbornly refuse to lie down. Writing from behind the walls of Mussolini's prisons, where he was confined from 1926 to 1935, Gramsci wrote as follows about his conjuncture. The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Gramsci was referring, of course, to how even though the political and, e and economic order of the long 19th century was very evidently in terminal crisis, a new hegemonic configuration had failed to crystallize. 
the Italy of his time was instead caught up in a turbulent process in which progressive and reactionary political forces were locked in struggle over who would give form and direction to the country's future. Applying Gramsci's concept to the current Euro-American context, Runa Muller-Stahl has argued that the concept of interregnum should be read as referring to a period of uncertainty, confusion and disagreement among elite groups in which former ideologies, although they still have institutional power, lose traction and become disoriented. An interregnum, then, is much more than just a crisis of the economy. It is a crisis of ideological legitimacy. Importantly, an interregnum is not a situation characterized by a total absence or collapse of order, but rather a period of competition between different strategies, backed by different alliances, potential or realized of social forces. So what I do in my notes is that I try to extend this understanding of Gramsci's concept to the current conjuncture in the Global South. Now, I want to go on and uh, outline a kind of diagnosis of the current moment in the Global South in the early 20th, uh, 21st century. And my starting point for doing so is the following statement uh, made 10 years ago by the United Nations Development Program. Um, and it goes as follows. The countries of the South, the report stated, have shown great resilience in the face of the current global economic crisis. The claim was made in the, in the context of its flagship human development report, which in 2013 had a telling title, The Rise of the South. In the report, the UNDP posited Brazil, India and China at the center of a long overdue process of global economic rebalancing. For the first time in 150 years, the report notes, the combined output of the developing world's three leading economies, Brazil, China, and India, is about equal to the combined GDP of the long-standing industrial powers of the North, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, and the United States. The notion that the South is rising and that the world system is currently characterized by a process of convergence propelled by emerging economic and political powers in Asia, Latin America and Africa is expressive of the fact that the global South has changed in ways that destabilize binary developmental cartographies predicated on a counterposing of a rich North and a poor South. More concretely, it reflects the fact that most countries in the Global South today are middle-income countries, that is, countries where GNI per capita ranges between $1,000 to $4,000, and that 75% of the world's population currently live in middle-income countries, which in turn generate about one-third of global GDP. All of these are World Bank statistics, by the way. Now, this new geography of development is, in, is, is, of course, in no small part a product of the resort to a spatial fix by transnational capital in the context of the crisis of capitalism in the global north in the 1970s and the concurrent processes of neoliberalization that have restructured southern economies in very important ways since, since the 1980s. With that being said, I want to make a very simple point in relation to this diagnosis of the global south in our time, which is that the new geography of development is also, in the words of Andy Sumner, a new geography of poverty. What I mean by this is that southern middle income countries are home to as many as 70% of the world's poor, with poverty being measured uh, at a monetary poverty line of approximately two and a half dollars a day. Significantly, poverty in middle-income countries cannot be attributed to an absolute lack of resources. Rather, poverty in middle-income countries is an expression of the fact that the economic growth that has lifted countries from low-income status to middle-income status is profoundly unequally distributed. And this inequality, in turn, reflects the many ways in which precarious work and super-exploitation undermines subsistence and social reproduction, a tendency that is manifest, for instance, in the steadily falling labor share of income across emerging economies. This tendency is effectively the power of capital writ large across the new geographies of development and poverty in the 21st century. 
Considering this, it seems evident to me that we need a new critical analytical approach to understanding the politics and political economy of the global south in the current conjuncture. At the core of this approach, and here we can go to slide six, at the core of this approach, uh, we should place the proposition that the same accumulation strategies that have, um, that have propelled the so-called rise of the South and thrown up the crisis of legitimation, um, which have the potential to destabilize and disrupt the hegemony of governing elites uh, and dominant groups. Let's go to the next slide, please. The most obvious example of this is, of course, the Arab Spring. Um, that is the wave of revolt that swept across much of North Africa and the Middle East in 2011 and 2012. Um, should we try and go to the next slide uh, or two slides down? If we can. All right, I'll just continue and then you can try and catch up. Contrary to what was portrayed in global mainstream media narratives at the time, the Arab Spring was not just animated by a youthful middle-class demand for the democratization of autocratic regimes. In fact, the uprisings across the MENA region uh, were propelled by a composite demand for bread, freedom and social justice. A demand which reflected the fact that the region had gone through numerous social crises in the decade preceding the uprisings, that this was a period marked by extremely high levels of unemployment, poverty, mm. rising food prices and the growing precariousness of daily existence. And I'm quoting the work of Adam Hania here. It also bears noting that the Arab Spring erupted after a decade of intensifying social protests, mobilized in no small part by insurgent labor movements. The Arab Spring, in turn, inaugurated a period that has been widely recognized as a decade of protests. <coughs> Just consider, for example, the massive uprising. Uh, if we go one back now, then we're on the same page. Um, uh, just consider, for example, the massive uprisings against the inequalities brought about by neoliberalized neoliberalization in 2019. Nevertheless, just as the popular revolts of the Arab Spring were beaten back by reaction, repression and counter-revolution across Asia, Africa and Latin America, the victories of progressive social movements from below in the decade that followed, that is the 2010s, <clears throat> have arguably been fewer and further between than the wins registered by reactionary social movements from above in the form of authoritarian populism. I recognize, of course, that many of the regimes that I refer to with this designation have both won and lost power uh, since the middle of the 2010s. But even in contexts where authoritarian populists have been ousted from power through electoral defeats, the fact remains that they signify the presence of strong right-wing forces on the terrain of southern politics. The question we must engage then is what work authoritarian populism does in this conjuncture, when very clearly the old is dying while the new cannot be born. My proposition is quite straightforward. Authoritarian populism in the global south can be understood as a hegemonic project to shore up the legitimacy of neoliberal orders in context where those orders are increasingly unable to sustain subsistence, social reproduction and dignified life for large layers of the population, and as a result are also potentially illegitimate and unstable. Importantly, what authoritarian populism has proven itself capable of in southern democracies is to elicit subaltern consent by deflecting discontent and harnessing complex structures of feeling that permeate the life worlds of precarious subaltern groups in the global south. More specifically, what I'm referring to here are those emotional cultures of precarity that Harry Petit, drawing on Lauren Berlant's notion of cruel optimism, refers to as the cruelty of hope in his work on young, unemployed, educated men in urban Egypt. The cruelty of hope, in short, refers to attachment to aspirations of social mobility and affluence that are unlikely to be realized in the context of inequality and precarity, and which in turn are deeply entangled uh, with disaffection and with anxieties of social decline, 
on that basis, uh, right-wing political forces have attempted, with varying degrees of success, to construct the kind of historical blocks that are needed to animate the current zombie phase of actually existing neoliberalism. Let me elaborate on this claim by surveying two cases of authoritarian populist regimes and movements across Latin America and Southeast Asia before turning in some more detail to the example of Modi's India. So if we go to the next slide now, that would be great. When Jair Bolsonaro, a former army captain and a marginal parliamentary backbencher, took power in Brazil, the largest democracy in Latin America, after the 2018 general election, his victory had, of course, been aided in significant ways by a slow-motion coup that culminated in the impeachment of President Dilma Rousseff in 2016 and brought more than a decade of rule by the left of centrist Workers' Party to an unceremonious end. This process was propelled by a new right-wing movement in Brazilian politics, a social movement from above that sought, as Rocha, Solano and Medeiros argue in their book, The Bolsonaro Paradox, to reverse the democratic advances made by subaltern groups in Brazilian society since 1988. Needless to say, these groups had been antagonized by the modest gains that poor Brazilians had made in the context of the Workers' Party inclusive neoliberalism. However, Despite such illiberal engineering, there's no reason to disregard the fact that Bolsonaro swept to power based on substantive popular support for his authoritarian populist projects. He won 55% of the vote in the runoff election, and very significantly, he prevailed against uh, the PT candidate among the so-called new middle classes, whose emergence is often credited to the economic growth and social inclusion policies overseen by the Workers' Party. In their ethnography of Bolsonaro voters in a low-income community in Porto Alegre, Rosana Pinero Machado and Lucia Scalco attribute popular support for Bolsonaro to what they call conservative subjectivity among subaltern groups, and especially among subaltern men. TT rule, they argue, boosted consumption, and in doing so, it also created a structure of feeling among an emergent lower middle class in which hope in the future was precariously straddled upon a new commoditized life. With the economic crisis that shook Brazil towards the end of the first half of the 2010s, much of this unraveled. Moreover, amid heightened levels of violent crime, disillusionment and anxiety set in among groups that until recently had aspired to upward social mobility through new forms of consumption. In this context, Bolsonaro's authoritarian populism emerged with a narrative that pitted a virtuous, hard-working, law-abiding people against a criminal vagabond as their other, and a promise to use the full force of the state to quell the threat posed by this other. In doing so, he was able to harness a conservative subjectivity that had crystallized in particularly defined ways among male voters in the lower middle class. These were men who, as Pinedo Machado and Skalko put it, had experienced a perceived erosion of their role as primary breadwinners, their purchasing power, their political voices in families, and in some, their patriarchal control over life. It bears noting here that Bolsonaro won 54% of the male votes and 41% of the female votes in the 2018 elections. Let me now change focus to Southeast Asia and the Philippines. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. In 2016, the general election in the Philippines was initially a three-way race between established candidates who promised to extend the benefits of economic growth to the poor and the middle classes. When Rodrigo Duterte, the former mayor of Davao City, entered as a late comer to the race, he changed the election narrative by foregrounding the idea that the Philippines was in a state of crisis and that drug trafficking was the root cause of this crisis. He grounded his political projects in a people of the binary that shares many similarities with that of Bolsonaro. In Duterte's case, Nicole Curato writes, the populist dichotomy is one between virtuous citizens versus hardened criminals, the scum of society, 
before Duterte are beyond redemption. This project was successful in an election which saw a record-breaking participation rate of 81.62%. Duterte won 39.01% of the vote. This landslide victory inaugurated a six-year reign that was marked above all by a war on drugs that left as many as 30,000 people dead. As several observers have noted, the war on drugs was effectively a war on poor people. Curato explains Duterte's success with reference to how his authoritarian populism appealed to the entangled political logics of anxiety and hope. Anxieties about the corrosive impact of violent crime in poor communities and hopes for material improvement in the future. The Japanese political scientist Wataru Kusaka has made a related argument in which he suggests that Duterte's authoritarian populism resonates um, uh, uh, <clears throat> resonates with um, sorry resonates with what he refers to as the moral politics of the urban poor. Duterte's victory, he argues, signaled a remarkable shift in hegemonic moral discourse and the emergence of a desire for discipline that transcended class lines. Among poor Filipinos, Kusaka suggests, Duterte's ideological vocabulary appeals to a quintessentially neoliberal moral universe that pits good, moral and entrepreneurial citizens against their evil and immoral others, an entity that is embodied by criminals involved in the drug trade. It's significant, of course, that Duterte's authoritarian populism rose to power in the context of a trajectory of neoliberalization that has brought about what Toby Carroll has referred to as the death of development in the Southeast Asian region. That is a form of neoliberal capitalism centered on a, post, on a broad-based cultivation of low-level profit-oriented activity that is incapable of bringing about the kind of structural transformation and material progress that's normally associated with the term development. As Mark Thompson has pointed out, in the Philippines, which has the highest poverty rates in the ASEAN region, Duterte's authoritarian populism has conveniently diverted attention from the continued failure of growth to improve the conditions of the poor. In this way, Duterte was able to construct a vote base by fusing middle-class Filipinos that were anxious of losing whatever gains they had seen in recent decades, and poor people who were frustrated about the absence of gains from growth without departing from neoliberal policy regimes and without pursuing structural reforms in a deeply unequal society. Now, a key point that runs throughout these two examples is, of course, that authoritarian populism, as much as it, is, as it is a conservative hegemonic project that seeks to deflect discontent with the precarity and inequality of neoliberalization, has been capable of garnering support and consent. This was, of course, a key part of Hall's argument about authoritarian populism. Indeed, one of the central purposes of his theorizing of authoritarian populism was to be able to decipher just how such a hegemonic project was able to win consent from below and how it worked through popular moral orders to do so. Importantly, Paul was very clear that in doing this, authoritarian populism engaged with genuine contradictions in society. He wrote, its success and effectivity does not lie in its capacity to dupe unsuspecting folk but in the way that it addresses real problems, real and lived experiences, real contradictions, yet is able to represent them within a logic of discourse, which pulls them systematically into line with policies and class strategies of the right. Much of the same is true in the case of Southern authoritarian populism, which represents real contradictions grounded in structures of feeling that originate in forms of accumulation and processes of class formation fueled by neoliberalization in ways that align these contradictions with right-wing hegemonic projects. This, I submit, is the work that authoritarian populism does in Southern Interregnum, and to probe more deeply into its dynamics, I turn in closing to the case of Modi's India. So let's just stay on this current slide for a bit. As most of you will know, India has been ruled by the right-wing Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, and its leader, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, based on two landslide general election victories in 2014 and 2019, respectively. 
The BJP, in turn, has based its rule on a hegemonic project of neoliberal Hindu nationalism that appears to enjoy broad popular support. Indeed, according to some polls, Narendra Modi is the most popular political leader in the world, with durable approval ratings of more than 70%. Let me first briefly explain what I mean by neoliberal Hindu nationalism. When I refer to the hegemonic project of Modi and the BJP as neoliberal, I'm referring to how the accumulation strategies of the Modi regime are focused on carving out spaces of accumulation for corporate capital, and how this in turn is coupled with a public narrative that focuses on the idea that India is done spending time in history's waiting room, and that it is now rising to a position of economic power in the world system. When I refer to Hindu nationalism as a key component of the BJP's hegemonic project, I'm referring to the ideology of the Hindu nationalist movement, which is predicated on the idea that India is and should be a Hindu nation. These two elements come together in an imaginary in which, as Ravinder Kaur has put it, the rising new nation where entrepreneurial citizens can make affluent futures for themselves is also an ancient Hindu civilizational culture that assumes new forms but never loses its original essence. Now let's go to the next slide, please. Now, India is, in many ways, the perfect example of the kind of southern economy that I'm concerned with in this lecture. It's a middle-income country which, from the early 2000s to the middle of the 2010s, experienced strong economic growth. However, India is also perversely unequal. The top 10% of the population earns 50% of national income and owns 65% of national wealth. In fact, India has the third highest number of dollar billionaires in the world, 169 in total, and this elite has seen its wealth skyrocket since Modi took power in 2014. According to Forbes magazine, Indian billionaires are, more, are worth $675 billion as of 2023. That's down $75 billion from 2022, following Gautam Adani's wealth crash earlier this year. On the other end of the spectrum, the poorest 50% of the Indian population earns 13% of all national income and owns only 6% of national wealth. Now, a key factor underlying this perverse inequality is the fact, recently pointed out by Jean Drez, that the real wages of agricultural laborers, construction workers, and non-agricultural workers, which is basically the majority of the working class, was less than 1% per annum between 2014 and 2022. Like in other middle-income countries, inequality is closely linked to poverty in India. In fact, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, some 60% of the Indian population lived on less than 3.10 US dollars a day. Now, there's no new government data uh, on poverty levels in India today, but we do know that some 80% of the 71 million people who fell into poverty during the pandemic were Indian. However, despite such uneven and unequal development, Modi and the BJP enjoys, enjoys substantial support across the Indian population and significantly also among lower caste groups, among Dalits and among the poor. To be clear, the BJP still has its, has its most substantial constituency where it has always had it, namely among upper castes, the rich and the middle classes. In the 2019 uh, elections, for example, the party won 61% of the upper caste vote and 44% of the vote from the rich and the middle classes. But since 2014, the party has built a considerable subaltern constituency as well, which is what underpins its overwhelming electoral victories and parliamentary majorities. Very crucially, what the BJP under Modi has managed to construct is a pan-Hindu vote base across the class and caste lines that typically fracture the Indian electorate. Indeed, in 2019, some 44% of all Hindu voters supported the BJP. So if we go to the next slide, uh, please, then we'll be able to see uh, visual representations uh, of this. Now, to understand this achievement, we need to consider how Narendra Modi's authoritarian populism relies on the extension of what W.E.B. Du Bois, the African-American sociologist, once referred to as psychological wages to subaltern groups. This brings us back to the imaginary of neoliberal Hindu nationalism that I outlined briefly just now. 
Let's go to the last slide, please. Modi's authoritarian populism is anchored in the construction of a fundamental division between an authentic Indian people and their anti-national enemies within. In this equation, uh, India's Hindu majority constitutes the people, and India in turn is a Hindu people nation, while its other is made up of corrupt elites, dissenters, and above all, India's Muslim minority. This construction finds its political embodiment partly in anti-Muslim violence, partly in Hindu nationalist lawmaking, and partly in the coercive policing of dissent in an increasingly beleaguered public sphere. Crucially, as I've already argued, Hindu nationalism is wedded to neoliberal ideological tropes in Modi's authoritarian populism, which promises that social mobility and material prosperity will materialize for the people of India, for the people as India completes its long overdue rise to global power and prosperity. While the statistics I've just shown you would have made it clear that such promises are quite elusive for most Indians, the fact remains that the hegemonic project of Modi's BJP re rests on a remarkably solid foundation of subaltern consent. To my mind, the explanation for this apparent conundrum lies in the psychological wages that Modi's authoritarian populism offers to India's subaltern citizens and popular classes. These psychological wages can be thought of as a double promise. On the one hand, a promise of development that appeals simultaneously to aspirations of social mobility and anxieties about social decline among people living just on the brink of abysmal poverty. On the other hand, a promise of dignity predicated on a common Hinduness, Hinduness that is often denied to those on the lower rungs of India's caste system. It is this double promise, I think, that has enabled Modi's BJP to prevent India's very palpable social crisis from morphing into a political crisis and to maintain what appears to be a very durable hegemony in Indian society. I'll end my notes here, and I reiterate that this is very, this is merely uh, a very cursory first cut attempt at making sense, making sense of the morbid symptoms of the current conjuncture in the global south. I realize I've said nothing about what a progressive response to these dynamics might look like, and I will limit myself in closing to noting that the key challenge before us is that of unsettling those hegemonic alliances that underpin the political power of southern authoritarian populism. How this might be done uh, is a question that demands the attention of anyone eager to see a new world born out of the crisis that we currently confront. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Al, for that intriguing and insightful talk. Um, since we started a little late, we'll jump straight into uh, Q&A uh, with the audience. Do we have a mic down there? I think Dr. Zedi has the first question. Uh, hello. Can you hear me, Alf? Yeah, I hear you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions, observations, and points of agreement and with contention. Uh, thank you for, I, I, in general, I clearly agree with you, but I think there are some, some, some problems in, in the way you've uh, made the argument. First of all, the four or five individuals that you identified, uh, Dutarte, Erdogan, uh, Bolsonaro, Modi, are all elected. So there's a, there's a problem with democracy also, not just authoritarianism or populism. When democracy elects authoritarian leaders, uh, perhaps we need to respect or recognize, I don't know which word you prefer, the voice of the people. So there's a problem there, and you've, you've answered that in your presentation as well, linking it to uh, neoliberalism and the crisis of anxiety and, and the precariousness and so on and so forth. So, and, and some of these leaders, uh, Modi and Erdogan, have been elected at least twice, Modi perhaps again in a few more months. Uh, so they've been re-elected, and the project of neoliberalism and authoritarian populism has lived hand in hand uh, with the, the, uh, the, while they have been in power. However, 
Uh, these people, Bolsonaro, uh, Duterte, um, uh, Erdogan, you know, they were authoritarian populists before they were elected as well. It's not just that when they came to power, they were able to complete the project of, they were able to take the project of authoritarianism and populism forward, but they were elected on the basis of what they would deliver. And they've done what they were going to deliver. So there's a, so there's, there's a, so, so I can understand this, this problem of once coming into power and then consolidating authoritarian populism makes sense, but there is sort of a prehistory to how people elect people who eventually or are authoritarian populists. So there's some some grey or sort of dark red, dark black or light white uh, the issues over there. You can decide. The second thing is obviously, um, and you may not even accept this term, that you don't look at left-wing populism. You know, they, you, don't, you don't even mention uh, Chavez or, or others and whoever. And I don't think he's a left-wing populist, but um, Partho Chatterjee's work, I Am the People, um, Nadia Urbi uh, Nati's work, and there's a lot of other work. Uh, Peron, for example, is, uh, is the, the original Peron a leftist or a right-wing person? He's elected by the workers as a leftist for, for rights for labor and wages, things that you're talking about, but that's where the term uh, Chantal and Mouffe and, you know, Laclau's work originates from Peronism in Argentina and so on and so forth. And Peron is the original um, populist in some ways. And he's, is he leftist or does he become rightist? So there's this transformation that takes place there. The third observation obviously is that there is... Um, I actually feel populism is temporary. You may not think so. You may think that it undermines structures, society, and gives a, a, a pedagogical emphasis to a certain type of authoritarianism. But if you look at the pink wave in Latin America, which you don't mention except because at all you mentioned Bolsonaro, if you look at the return of Lula, for example, Morales, Boric, uh, and others as well, uh, except Argentina, which is always a problem, uh, there is this, this and Africa, I know nothing about. So there is, again, the same neoliberalism, worse anxieties, um, the, the, the precariousness, precariousness of life that you talk about. It brings about new or even old people. I mean, Lula is 14 years after he was, he was thrown into prison. So he's back after uh, Doof and then and Bolsonaro. So how, how does that play out? Um, finally, the last observation is this argument of consent from below and subaltern consent, fair enough. What happened to the left-wing parties? I mean, why, I mean, you, you almost, there's almost an implicit, which you will never accept, but there's an almost an implicit sort of understanding in what you're saying that this is mere shackle, which can be taken, led astray by a, a Modi or an Erdogan. Uh, why is it not led astray by a Castro or a Che? Hmm. Why is it not led astray by people who offer an alternative to uh, the precariousness and the anxieties of life. I'm sorry for so many questions, but this is just an observations on, on what you said. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Alf. You can answer. All right. All right. Uh, thanks for all of that. Um, so to, just to your first observation that obviously uh, these, uh, the leaders that I've singled out are all electives. Uh, yes, indeed, they are, uh, and, and and I'm I'm interested primarily uh, in the emergence of authoritarianism in democratic contexts because I want to understand uh, the issue of um, of the kind of cross class alliances and with that subaltern complicity, if you will, uh, and consent for authoritarianism. I want to understand why the leaders that I've been talking about are able to draw into their ranks uh, classes who are at the receiving end of the disadvantageous impacts, if you will, the deleterious impacts of the kind of economic policies that they pursue, uh, the kind of economic policies that throw up the kind of inequalities that I've also referred to. So I'm really very interested in what it is that enables reactionary forces um, to pursue authoritarian projects through consent. This isn't the military coup that overthrows Allende or, you know, that throws out uh, a mildly reformist uh, Mossadegh or, or whatever. You know, this isn't an elite conspiracy. This is actually 
organizing and mobilizing. This is what I call hegemonic work. It's it, 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 it's building a political project that depends on gaining support and consent. That's the precondition of governing in democratic contexts. So, I mean, I, I don't I don't dispute anything that you said. I'm just I'm just trying, I guess, to explain my interest. Uh, and my interest comes from the fact that I I, I consider this as as, pro- as a problem that we must understand if we want to understand uh, democratic backsliding, if we want to understand autocratization, if we accept that these are issues, right? Um, and I think it's intimately related to what's often called the most, what's generally referred to as a sort of contemporary crisis of democracy, a loss of faith in democracy, uh, liberal democracy, representative democracy as an avenue through which uh, people's needs, aspirations, anxieties, and so on can be addressed. And what is it about these right-wing projects that make them so so able to do that? Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, when I comment on, on your other rem- uh, your other uh, remarks. Um, I'm very uh, very ready to agree also that uh, the people that I've been talking about, leaders that I've been talking about, were authoritarian populists before they were elected. Um, and that's actually, you know, as I develop this work, I've made this point uh, about the current scenario in India in other writing, uh, and this is the point that I also am uh, also working on, on elaborating now comparatively. I think this, what you're pointing to, is absolutely decisive. That uh, we can't just regard this uh, in electoral terms. We can't just regard. Uh, the leaders that I've been referring to uh, as, uh, you know, uh, as mandates. They are actually the, the sort of the figureheads, the helmsmen of what I call social movements from above. Reactionary social movements rooted in uh, the interests, if you will, of elite groups who uh, construct um, political projects aimed at the reproduction of hegemony in a context where, if you pardon me the use of a very sort of clanky old phrase, the objective conditions mm. uh, would suggest uh, great volatility, right? Uh, and there are two things that flow from that. One is that the truly durable authoritarian populist regimes are those that have developed most strongly a kind of movement infrastructure. This is very true, I think, of Erdogan, who is the authoritarian populist who has been in power the longest. Uh, his is a movement that, in a sense, curbed radical Islamism in Turkey, uh, you know, aided, of course, by the military coup of 97 and so on, uh, harnessed it uh, for a passive revolution uh, that could combine then uh, a sort of... Um, uh, house trained, if you will, uh, Islamism with neoliberalism into the kind of project that he pursues. Uh, the movement infrastructure of the AKP uh, in working class areas, in working class communities, and so on, is, is, is tremendously, uh, tremendously uh, impressive. And you might be aware that I've also, you know, argued this about the BJP. That I mean, the BJP's incredibly durable hegemony, there's no doubt that there's not an election victory coming in 24, uh, is based on 100 years of mobilizing, right, through the wider Hindu nationalist movement that has perforated India's civil society, and what we're seeing now is an extension of that to political society, and I, I use these terms in, in Gramsci's way, not in Chatterjee's way, which I've taken issue with elsewhere. Uh, when we're looking at Bolsonaro, uh, you know, Bolsonaro may or may not return, but the right-wing movement that picked him as their candidate will be there still, working its way through uh, through Brazilian society. It was very much a reaction to the PT as the culmination of a process of relative democratization of Brazilian society since, you know, 89 in a sense, right, when the transition from military dictatorship was over. And the point is that even though a certain elected leader might get booted out, as Bolsonaro was, with less of a margin than one would have liked to see, that movement will keep working. And it's precisely the ability, you know, as in the Filipino case as well, the ability to to weather a blow, to be able to take the, uh, you know, the occasional setback. This is the story of the BJP, right? 
uh, the, the sort of the fall of, of the Vajpayee government in 2004, unexpected, and then 10 years of UPA rule in India. But the ability to combat, the ability to be resilient, depends precisely, I think, on, on what you were saying. So again, I have absolutely you no, know, I, I don't think we have a much of a disagreement there. I, I think it's more that, uh, in fact, that the challenge for those of us who are either political sociologists or political anthropologists or, or dare I say, political scientists, we need to understand that these aren't just political parties running for elections. These are social movements from above seeking to build subaltern consent for essentially conservative hegemonic projects. Uh, you mentioned something about delivery. I mean, one could say that Erdogan has to a certain extent delivered to, to the sort of the informal working class in Turkey, but nevertheless the country is vastly unequal. Uh, I can think of other leaders among those I've, I've mentioned who haven't delivered at all in terms of, let's call them material wages. And that is why I point to psychological wages. Uh, you know, the concept that I draw from Du Bois' sociology of the U.S. South and, and race and class relations there as being something that we need to factor in. And I think it's quite integral to right-wing populism and authoritarian populism as such because, you know, these are projects that deliver material benefits above all to the top 1% or the top 10% of society. So what they must have something else then that they're giving to the bottom 50. And it's mostly psychological. Uh, but I don't think we should underestimate that. I think we're seeing in election victory after election victory after election victory in certain cases the durability of that. And I think a lot of critical thinking, uh, a lot of left academic thinking, um, hasn't, has failed to engage properly with that and has simply sat around waiting for the objective conditions to come and bite you know, these leaders on the backside. And it doesn't quite happen. Left-wing populism, you know, you're right that I don't address it. Um, that's simply because I'm concerned. My concern is with right-wing populism. Uh, I have no fancier response than that, you know. Uh, and ultimately, that's, it's, it's simply a subjective, you know, a reflection of my subjective concerns. <laughs> I haven't got anything else really to offer. But that's also why I emphasize Stuart Hall, because my, my, my interest isn't really in populism as the sort of, you know, and the kind of political science that basically says, you know, whether it's right wing or left wing, it's the same as populism. And that, let's now look at how it's performed. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in how right wing populism is a response to a particular sort of political economic conjuncture. Uh, I'm interested in so the social forces underpinning it, less than I'm interested, I think, in the performance. And that's what Stuart Hall g gives me. And I'm actually a bit surprised at how how little his work is used at the current moment, because I do think it's fairly relevant. Um, populism is temporary, the, the sort of the waxing and the waning. You're absolutely right. I do think there's something about what we refer to as left-wing populism as being a sort of an insufficient left project. And the comparison between Brazil and India is, uh, to the extent that you can call Lula a, a sort of a left-wing populist, uh, it can be quite instructive there. Because with the UPA and with the Workers' Party, what you see are what I refer to, uh, I think of them as inclusive neoliberal political projects. So the, the economic policy remains fundamentally neoliberal, but you latch onto that. Uh, certain forms of social protection, rights-based legislation in India, and lots of the rights-based legislation that was introduced during the UPA was, was really quite good. Uh, the Forest Rights Act, you know, the, the rural, National Rural Employment Guarantee, and so on and so forth. Um, in Lula's case, you have increasing minimum wages, you obviously have the bolts of Amelia, and so on. But the thing is that none of the, these things really disturbed, really threatened the interests of corporate capital. Uh, in the Indian context, it was finally actually the, the new resettlement and rehabilitation policy that, 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 that really unsettled the large corporate houses and made them tilt decisively towards the BJP, where they have remained ever since. Um, so I think there's something about, how can I put it? I think mildly reformist left regimes will have a tendency to be swept away very easily because they don't... Um, they don't push the front line far enough. Uh, they don't depart decisively enough from the neoliberalism that has produced inequality and precarity. And that means that uh, you know, subaltern attachments to those projects can very easily, I think, be, um, how should I call it, what should I call it, disconnected, you know, 
they can be loosened and moored to other and reactionary projects. I think there's something there. I'm struggling to find, you know, in my current work, I'm struggling to find the words to to to, to articulate this. But I think it's something about, uh, you know, not building the kind of infrastructures and a t political attachment that gives you durability, that gives your project durability. I think that's uh, what's been going on in in some of these cases. What happened to the left? Well, I mean. <laughs> You tell me. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what we're all wondering? Look, I think there's there, there's something to be, and, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm jo that's a friendly joke, by the way. Uh, I think that there's something here that, uh, that 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 is actually really true. I think there's a vacuum uh, where old lefts have declined. In some cases, you know, the universe of new social movements that replaced the old left, or that in some cases competed for space with the old left, have also declined. Mm -hmm. India is a case of this. Uh, in the Philippines, the left was smashed. In Turkey, the left was smashed. Um, in Brazil, the left is a, a sort of mildly social democratic workers' party. Thank you. Um, Alf. No, it appears yeah. that we oh. are. It appears that we are completely <laughs> out of time. Um, I think. Shall we take the student question? There's one student question. Let's take it. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, my question is uh, like very straightforward, but I am more interested about the subaltern perspective, the perspective from the below, right? Uh, I, the question is like, is it that the subaltern seems to find their voice within the authoritarian politics, or is it the failure of the liberal politics or the liberal frameworks that uh, somehow like subalternize their voices, like they somehow the, the vices do not go up in the liberal politics. So do you think that's the reason that the subaltern are more tempted towards this uh, authoritarian uh, he hegemonic powers? Thank you. Yeah, uh, in, a, in, in a nutshell, yes. Uh, I think that you know, liberal political formations have relatively little to offer uh, subaltern groups. Uh, and I think that is what uh, you know, fosters an absence of political attachment to those projects, and, and rightly so. I mean, uh, you know, if, if you look at the Brazilian case, what preceded Lula, you know, didn't have much to give at all uh, to, to uh, and I think here the Cardoso regime didn't have much at all to, to give the working classes. And I think what's being given, in a sense, is, is a politics of promise and a politics of psychological wages through authoritarian populism, which is at least that, right? Du Bois famously argued about white workers, poor white workers in the U.S. South. Why is it that they don't rise up along with black workers against, uh, you know, their exploiters? Well, it's because white workers are extended the psychological wage of at least some white, right? And so what does a Duterte do? He says to a poor person, well, at least you're a decent, dignified, honest, hardworking person. You're not the scum. Bolsonaro does the same thing. And, and with that comes a, comes a promise of development. Stick with it, you know, somewhere down the road, something good is going to come to you. And it's amazing to me how durable those kind of promises are. And of course, I've alluded to, 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 to similar dynamics being at play um, in, uh, in, uh, in other contexts like India and Brazil as well. That's, so, so I thought so there's something there. Uh, I don't think we understand the full nature of it because we have the ethnographic work still remains to be done. And I do hope that there are young scholars such as yourself who would be interested in taking up that particular challenge. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very intrigued by the way you have used the concept of psychological wages. And I hope uh, I'm looking forward to your further articulation of this, uh, of this theory. But um, we do need to end. There is another session following. Thank you so much for joining us online today. Big hand for Professor Nilsson. Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure.